Hey everybody, it's Jeff from San Diego Seed Company. We are out in the garden and the orchard today on a beautiful summer day in 2023. I'm gonna start over. Okay, it is summertime. Today we're talking about squash, specifically summer squash, maintenance, how to expand your harvest throughout the season, everything that you need to know from going from one of those gardeners that gets the little tiny crappy squash to like tons of squash, so much that you're gonna have to give it away to your neighbors, your mailman, whoever walks by your house, you're just giving it away because you're so good at growing squash. If you wanna be that type of gardener, stay tuned. Before we get into all that, don't forget to like and subscribe, hit the bell so you're notified anytime we put out new content. So let's go take a look in the garden. Before we go any farther, can we just look at how majestic this leaf looks? It's like something out of prehistoric times. This is one of my favorite things about squash is just how big the leaves are. Um, but if you think about it, squash fruits are pretty big themselves, so they're gonna need a lot of photosynthesizing. So it makes sense, big fruit needs big plants. Okay, enough salivating over leaves. I never thought that I would say that in my 20s if you asked me if I was gonna be salivating over the size of a squash leaf, I would have said, you're crazy. But here we are, right? Let's talk a little bit about summer squash versus winter squash. Then I'm gonna get into these seven things that you have to do when it comes to squash to improve your harvest. So I am gonna be vulnerable here. When I first heard the terms summer squash and winter squash, like a lot of you probably did, thought winter squash were grown in the winter. That is not true. All squash are warm season crops. They're grown in the spring and summer. The difference is summer squash have soft exteriors, winter squash have hard exteriors. Think pumpkins, think butternut squash, think spaghetti squash, anything that has a hard external shell, those are winter squash because they last until winter. You can store those in a cool place and they're gonna give you food all winter long. Hence, winter squash. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about the seven things that you need to do to improve your harvest. Okay, tip number one, know what kind of squash you're growing. I call the two different types of summer squash pole or bush. Right here, we have what I would call a pole squash. I don't know if that's actually a term, but it helps me remember it because the central stalk is like one single pole. If you wanted to, you could put a pole in here or a post and tie it to it and let this central stalk grow up and have the leaves come out and kind of grow it vertically in the garden. That is a pole squash. A bush squash is gonna be much more bushy. Notice there's a ton of airflow. There's only maybe 10 leaves. Bush squash just bifurcate and bifurcate and send out tons of leaves and they're more compact and small but they do have a lot more plant matter. So the reason you need to know the difference is really about pruning. With pole squash, you prune the bottom leaves underneath. Sometimes with bush squash, it's really difficult to get in there and prune because there's so many tight vines and leaves and the fruit gets in there and it's just tough to get your clippers in. So be aware, I prefer pole squash just because they're a little easier to handle. So as you can see in front of me, these are two pole squash. This is a really good example. There's one long central stem with leaves coming off of it for both of these. We actually had a bush squash in here earlier this year that it was just so big and so massive and so dense. We got tons of fruit off of it but we ended up taking it out to give more space for these two. So, on to number two. How many squash plants should you grow? I understand a lot of you are in smaller spaces, maybe a balcony or just a really small corner of your backyard. So the idea of dedicating a lot of space to just one or two plants seems intimidating. It seems like a waste of space. But if you do get into the squash game, at least grow two plants. Here's why. Squash, as we've talked about several times, have male flowers and female flowers. You can tell it's a female flower because there is a fruit on the back side of it. This is a spent female flower that has already been fertilized. Okay, so the main reason you grow at least two, and if you can, three or four or five or six, is your odds of fertilization go way up the more plants you have. You've got male flowers, 
that need to get their pollen into the female flower or you don't get any fruit. With just one plant, sometimes the timing just doesn't work out right. The female flowers come early or the male flowers come early and they kind of miss each other. When you have multiple plants, you just increase your odds of letting the bees and the butterfly do their thing. Now, if you don't have the space, you can go ahead and just grow one plant. But if you do that, I would highly recommend taking this male flower the morning that you see the female flower open up. You're gonna take the petals off, take this nice juicy pollen, and you're gonna stick it right in that female flower, give it a little diddle, and then you're gonna have some fruit. Tip number three, spacing. And then with spacing, we're talking about airflow. So spacing is really important for nutrients and moisture. But with squash, you really, really have to look out for airflow. So look at the back of the package. A lot of the packages, I laugh because it says 18 inches. In my opinion, I would go at least two feet. And if you do two feet, don't do square foot gardening and put them two feet by two feet in a grid. You will never have enough airflow. If you're gonna do 18 inches or two feet at minimum, do a row and then give at least walkable, maybe two more feet or three feet in between the rows. You're just gonna have problems with powdery mildew and just gross plants because you don't have enough airflow. So if you get them spaced correctly, as you can tell earlier from these long viney plants, they're gonna wanna go somewhere. So you can either send them up or just let them go wherever they wanna go. When it comes to airflow, these plants at this point in their life I really don't need to do much pruning. It's when they're small and they're close together and every single plant is right at the base of the plant and the leaves are going everywhere that I definitely recommend getting in there and adding some airflow manually by trimming the lower leaves. So you'll pick the vine up, any leaf that's underneath the fruit, meaning south of the fruit, closer to the roots, you can go ahead and get rid of that. You can actually see on that side, we've already harvested a fruit that was right next to that leaf. Now we're gonna take these leaves, let them photosynthesize, and to grow out these fruits, leaving all of those into the compost. Okay, number four, this is something that anybody who's ever grown any broad, soft, fuzzy leaf plant has dealt with, and that is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is different than what you see on this leaf. This leaf has white colorations on it um, that from afar could look like powdery mildew, but you'll know the difference if I were to rub my finger on that and that was powdery mildew, it would come off, I could actually see it come off and be able to rub it in between my fingers. This is not powdery mildew, but it is something that you're gonna wanna watch out for. How do you deal with it? Number one, don't overhead water. Powdery mildew grows in damp environments where the leaves haven't had a chance to dry out. It's just more conducive to grow than with drier plants, so don't overhead water. If you do start to see powdery mildew, you can remove the plant, the leaves, and you should remove the leaves, but don't think that just by removing those leaves, you're gonna somehow stop the growth of powdery mildew. It's kind of like cockroaches. They say once you see them outside, you've probably got 100,000 behind the walls. Once you finally see the evidence of powdery mildew on the plant, the plant is already infested. So removing those leaves will get that leaf off. It's not really gonna photosynthesize if it's covered in mildew, um, and it will, to an extent help this plant not spread as much powdery mildew, but what it's really doing is lowering the amount of powdery mildew in your garden so that this powdery mildew doesn't spread to other things in your garden. Don't overhead water, remove the leaves, and airflow. That airflow is gonna dry out those leaves and make them less likely to grow more mildew. Now one thing you can do to get ahead of the mildew is get any antifungal spray, like a copper fungicide or neem oil also works for it. Uh, I know Bridgette's not a huge fan of neem oil because it gets overused, uh, but it can help uh, if you go once a week maybe pick a Monday or pick Sunday, whatever day you're gonna be out in the garden consistently and say, all right, I'm gonna go out and just spray my plants even though I don't see evidence yet of powdery mildew. What you're doing is you're creating a, an environment that is less conducive to grow mildew. It's not really a wives tale, it's something that has caught on the internet that we've actually used with huge success in our cucumbers is milk spray. You're gonna take cow's milk, 
mix it one to one with water, come out and spray once a week. Maybe it's a placebo effect, I don't know, but it sure as heck worked. We did not get an ounce of powdery mildew on our cucumbers all season long. Okay, tip number five to get more harvest, bigger, better harvest, is harvest. And I'm talking about daily. You need to get out into the garden daily to look at your plant. The thing with squash, especially if you're growing green squash, is they can hide. Sometimes, like if you see, this is why it's so important to come out on a daily basis. Um, this female flower hasn't opened yet, so I know it's not been pollinated, but I would guess tomorrow morning, this sucker is gonna open all the way. Hopefully a bee comes by. This male flower gives us some, some female flower, some of its pollen, and it's gonna make this into a fruit. And before you know it, I'm talking like just a few days, it can go from this size to almost inedible. So the thing with squash is a lot of people say, oh my gosh, look how big that squash is. It must be delicious. I can't believe, what are they doing so special? The bigger the squash is, the worse it tastes. The worse it tastes. The bigger the squash is, the worse that it tastes. The outside starts to get hard, the seeds develop, the texture of the actual vegetable, the fruit, is just not very good. So I would look at the grocery store see how long those are. I'm talking maybe like six inches long, not too fat. Harvest them earlier. As we've said in almost all of our videos, the more you harvest, the more the plant is gonna put out more flowers, more leaves to make more bigger harvest for you. Okay, number six, succession plant. We say this for almost every crop in the garden, but specifically squash, is because they are gonna give and give and give, and then one day you're just gonna come out and it's grandpa leaf. There's <laughs> There's really no coming back from this. It's not that we did anything wrong at all. We actually did everything right. But leaves have a lifespan, and this one is getting towards the end of it. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this leaf off, because uh, it's not really doing much. Um, I'm just gonna let the good looking leaves stay, remove all these. I'm gonna go into my office. I'm gonna find some more squash seeds. If you remember from our what to plant in uh, May, June, and July videos, the bigger the seed, um, the more likely it's gonna succeed outdoors, and we always recommend direct sowing squash seeds. So I'm gonna clear a little area, water this, water this in, make a little hole, plant my seeds, and then once this comes up, I'm just gonna chop this at the base, let the old one die, and make room for the new one. All right, number seven, and finally, rip out unhealthy dying plants. I know it can be so tempting. It's your first squash that you've ever grown, and you got it to something this size, and then it starts to go brown and ugly. You're like, I don't want to kill my baby. I spent so much time. It's just part of the life cycle. Like we said in tip six, you've got to remove the old plants to make room for the new plants. That's going to really increase your harvest, and give you just a healthier garden overall. Okay, one final note on removing the dead plants. If that plant has evidence of a lot of powdery mildew, just a reminder, don't put it in your compost, put it in your green bin. If you're in San Diego, the city has actually given us green bins because they're starting to do green waste in our community, which is awesome. Put it in that bin, let the dump take care of it because their composting gets hot enough to kill that. Your backyard composting might not. Also, just a reminder, the beauty of buying your own seeds and not buying plants in the store is one, it's economical. I saw plants that are like seven, eight, nine dollars a piece, which is absolutely insane. So compare buying one plant for eight dollars to a seed pack that's gonna have 10, 15, 20, 30 seeds in it for four dollars. It just makes a lot more sense and it gives you that opportunity to succession plant, especially us who are in zone nine and 10, we've got such a long growing season that a squash plant that takes 55, 60 days to mature, we've got enough for two, maybe three rounds of squash. So get out there, buy your seeds, and start growing some squash and getting those huge harvests.